uh, webinar where we were talking about the social media guidelines. Basically, whenever you go to the LinkedIn uh, or I don't know, yeah, in the LinkedIn, you, you should go to the licenses and certifications or courses and under, uh, not under the education, uh, you need to indicate, uh, you, need just, you just start typing the uh, Stanford Center for Professional Development and you will see that it will auto-populate. So for instance, there's an example, uh, basically uh, Bernard, one of our C, uh, CPIs, uh, you can see that in, on his LinkedIn profile under the licenses and certifications, he is a CPI, we got 28 of them here today. So, uh, you know, this is how you can uh, indicate your uh, certification after today's session. Uh, this is how you should not do it under the education section uh, and uh, under and choosing the just Stanford University. This is wrong. This is not something that you should be doing. I'm going to be sharing this presentation with you afterwards, obviously, but just like uh, to memorize it once again. Um, once again, here is how you should tag the, um, the companies, the, the Stanford Center for Professional Development, JIC, this is the uh, hashtags you can use. You should not definitely call this a Stanford Global Innovation Catalyst or Stanford's idea to market, etc., or anyone else. So it's just like this is not Stanford JCX program, so it's SCPD uh, JCX online program. I hope this is all clear and we will avoid all this uh, uh, miscommunication in, in, in a well. Uh, uh, putting something on social media. So uh, once again, here is what you can follow. This is the, the page you should tag, Stanford Center for Professional Development with this kind of logo and definitely not the Stanford University. Uh, to make this uh, today's pitching a bit more spicy, we decided that we're going to have a couple of nominations. So one of them will be the best pitch, which is going to be a public vote. You guys will be choosing your peers. You will be anonymously uh, choosing who was the best today in pitching uh, out of seven teams, out of eight teams, sorry. Um, best team, this is going to be the, the judge's choice. Uh, I'm going to introduce them a bit later. The, the startup progress is going to be myself and Ozan, who's going to be choosing. We already have uh, some pre-selections and uh, happy to, to announce that later on. Um, so, you know, we've been working with you to the, through the whole program and we know which teams progressed uh, uh, better than others. Chairman's choice, this is Kamran, is going to be announcing that one. So no pressure, <laughs> but that's going to be a couple of just nice uh, nominations afterwards and nice uh, diplomas from the uh, JSC side. So, the pitching order, uh, I didn't receive any uh, requests from you guys, whether you want to be the first, the last, or in the middle or something. So alphabetical, pretty straightforward, starting with Argilot, uh, finishing with Zawadi, the vendor gifts uh, girls. And uh, we're going to have a small break after the four of the teams, and then a small break for the jury deliberation. And we're going to announce these nominations later on today and do the final remarks. This is the agenda for today. So the rules of the game, you guys all know it. Um, five minutes for pitch, uh, five minutes for the judges to provide the feedback to the pitching team. Uh, there is no need to actually answer the questions or comments of the judges. There is no need to respond to them. So just like take notes, uh, get the feedback, uh, try to get the most out of this interaction with the judges. Oh, before we go into this one, I actually wanted to ask the judges to introduce themselves briefly. Uh, you all know them, but just uh, maybe just for them to give a, an opportunity to uh, send a couple of remarks before you start the pitch. Should we start with Kamran, who is the first one on my screen? Hello, everyone. Uh, wonderful to see your uh, happy faces again. Uh, many of you are dear friends, uh, so it's uh, wonderful to catch up after uh, all these times. Uh, I used to travel a lot and uh, uh, haven't done that. Uh, so as soon as COVID is over, I will be back to your countries and looking forward to create uh, some trouble together. So really <laughs> looking forward. Thanks, Cameron. Mike, you're the next one on my, in my list. Uh, yeah, Mike Lyons. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of, uh, of the content on this program. Uh, started uh, about a dozen companies and uh, uh, been teaching entrepreneurship at Stanford for a long, long time. Pedro, thank you, Mike. 
think you guys have all seen plenty of me. My, my voice may sound different in person than in the videos, and I apologize, I'm recovering from a cold. But I'm very much looking forward to, to meeting you guys and hearing your pitches. All right. Thank you all. Thanks to the judges. Guys, are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. So we should start with the first one, which is Agrilat. So Tariq, Tabo, what? Um, Just, uh, feel free to share the screen and we start it. Okay. Let me share my screen. Yeah. And as always, I'm going to be uh, measuring time on my phone. So nothing has changed since last time, unless Ozan wants to send his Yoda kid. <laughs> yeah, I can do a five minute one. I yes. You guys are okay. Sure. That'd okay. be great. Okay. Um, are we ready to go? Yeah. All right. Good luck. Let's do it. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Tariq. I'm from Saudi Arabia. I'm here to tell you today about Agrilat a place where you can find farms fast. Farming is the art of losing money while working 400 hours a week. That's usually what I get in the past when I talk to investors about farming in Saudi Arabia. But somehow after COVID, um, people have started to change their tunes. So you know, I've started to get phone calls in the last few months asking about agricultural investments and how to find farmland to invest in agriculture. Now, most of these phone calls come from all different people from different backgrounds, different parts of Saudi Arabia, but most of them have one thing in common. They know very little about farming. Now, if you want to farm, you need farmland. And if you have farmland, you really most of the time don't know what to do with it. I mean, you have questions like, you know, can I turn this into a profitable agricultural project or should I just sell it at market value? So you don't really know where to start. And by the time you get answers to your questions, um, it makes you anywhere from two weeks to three months and several thousand Saudi rials. So I thought about putting together a place where you can get good answers fast. This is why we're creating Agrilot. It's a digital online platform where you can basically list your land, create an online profile about your land, give us some data, We'll take that data, we'll get some more data, we'll analyze that data, and we'll figure out what your land is truly worth. And then we'll help you turn it into an attractive investment. So once you, for a simple fee, you can maybe post your land on our profile and people who want to land to reach the land will probably be able to go on the website and find it, compare prices, all from the comfort of their own homes uh, on their laptops or their uh, mobile devices. So basically, if you go to a real estate website on Saudi Arabia, this is what you're gonna find. We wanna turn this into this. And our value proposition is that we're gonna give you reliable data, thereby increasing the transparency of the transaction. And we're gonna be easy to use, we'll save you time and hopefully some money. Globally, agriculture is a market that's worth $2.4 trillion. And it's expected to triple in size in the next 10 years. Now, uh, basically this is also true for Saudi Arabia where we looked at the competitor landscape and we found a lot of real estate platforms but very few of them that specialize in agricultural services and investment. And we really think that this is gonna be our beachhead market, a sort of company that provides real estate services tailored for agriculture. So what's our go-to-market strategy? Um, basically we're gonna start out as real estate brokers and we're gonna charge basic subscription, subscription fee for people to list their lands. And we're gonna get commissions, about 2.5% of you know, each sort of uh, contract or sale that goes through us. And we planned out before uh, we actually launch our profile uh, and services and our online platform, the first 180 days, we really wanna secure clients and really sort of verify our assumptions about the market. And while we're making those clients happy and guaranteeing maybe strategic client happy experience, we're going to work on an MVP and figure out what our uh, sort of gross uh, transaction value is actually. Uh, we already have some traction because we talked to three potential partners. One of them has agreed to already put a down payment of $200,000 to $300,000 as seed money. And we have about 60 farmland owners in the sales pipeline. Now, what's the ask? We're looking for about 250,000 pre-seed funding as convertible note. 
and really not so much equity partners as strategic partners. We need sort of people who know agriculture real estate and we know people who want to develop sort of AI solutions and really help exceed and excel, add value to the, to the platform. This is our team. Uh, myself, I have eight years of experience in agriculture and a few startups. Olga has experience in data analysis and marketing. Uh, Tabo is our guy with logistics and supply chain management. And Rowan, she has really good experience really taking sectors that haven't been traditionally digitalized and like construction and turning them into uh, an act, a sort of a technology uh, friendly sector. Uh, and that is it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any questions. Thank you. That was, uh, you still have 15 seconds, but good one. Good one. All right. Judges, time for feedback. I have a question. Uh, you said that you have uh, 60 farmers in the pipeline. Uh, how many of them have you actually talked with them and how extensive have the talks been? I've spoken to landowners and I've spoken to farmers and investors. So out of those 60, I've really uh, talked with maybe 12 to 20 in, ex in extended length. And the other ones, I've just basically uh, secured interest, that they're interested in doing the service. And uh, how much progress have you made in your MVP? We have sort of an idea after talking to a few sort of tech companies, like what sort of prototype we, uh, they can offer us. But what I really want to focus on is just the user experience. Like we need to like sort of come up with more than one user experience uh, that, and we see based on that user experience, which one is really going to be the one we launch in. This is why I want to secure clients and sort of make sure they have a very positive experience so I can turn that into testimonials for our site later on. So what we've, what we've agreed is that we're not going to go and build the MVP site prior to having meaningful data that we can utilize in order to help us build the site that can be utilized. Yeah, the challenge is you have two different audiences. Uh, one is uh, the investor who want to invest in uh, real estate uh, for farming. And then the other one seems like uh, uh, you have uh, to deal with the farmers and uh, find your site be meaningful to them. So uh, that's why I was asking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the, the biggest burning need is with the landowners. And this is a problem that you know, me and my team agreed exists in several countries, not in Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of land uh, that people don't know what to do with. And that's gonna be, I think, our biggest user population. But out of that, you also get a people who are you know, looking for specific types of land and they have certain uh, focus. And once we sort of build up our user base and build up our network, network effects, then hopefully we'll be able to tailor those solutions to those investors. Just a real quick question. How, how do you get the data? You, you had made a good point early on that, that they're finding the data and getting, getting good data is really tricky because you can't get it now. And it mm -hmm. takes a long time. How, how are you doing it? That's a good question. I basically, I'm trying to go to the slide here so I can show you. Um, so Green Technology Group has actually got 20 years of ag experience in the region, in Saudi Arabia and neighboring countries. They already have a lot of data already available. And uh, a lot of this data is actually free and open source. A lot of people can get it. Um, but what people don't have is the ability to really take that data and make something useful out of it, like make a business case out of it. So it's not so much the data you have widely available, satellite data, sort of water uh, basin history and like water aquifer histories, uh, you know, and whatever you can find online, but it's also like uh, the data you get from specialized data based on specialized locations like soil analysis, water analysis, um, you know. And so combined with that, learning how to turn that into sort of grades of agricultural land. There's a grade A, investment for hydroponics. There's a grade B investment for uh, palm tree and date production. And these categories is really what is gonna be our secret sauce, basically. Because um, everyone can turn their land into something that you can grow with if you have the right ingredients and you know what you're doing. Great, thanks.
Mm. One last minute, 50 seconds. Any other so, questions? So this is this is a classic marketplace um, problem, and, and there's there's definitely a chicken and egg here going on. Um, I think the, the fact that you've identified at least what you believe to be the bottleneck being on the on the supply side of the market, um, sorry, being on the demand side of the market, I think is is consistent. Um, so I, I would I would encourage you to kind of think through what what Comron was asking, which is which which constituent are you actually building the MVP for? Because you can actually hold the hands of the side of the market that, that you know you can control because the need is there, and then really tailor your so, your solution and all your prototyping around trying to lure in the demand side of the market, right? Which is basically the the, the money capital side. Um, so that would be my encouragement in terms of a next step, which would be to really think about um, really outlining what, what does a transaction look like? What is the piece of it that you can control? And what is the piece of it that you're experimenting with on, on the demand generation piece of it, such that, that you can actually then say, yep, you know, here, here's how we think we can scale this thing. Because right now that, that piece of really understanding what the transaction looks like for you is, is, is still a little bit ambiguous. Mm -hmm. um, but, but clearly you've done all the legwork. So I just think that there's a, just a little bit more articulation around that would be super helpful for you. Great, appreciate and that. I, I would make a one a quick comment also. You may want to look into it. Of course, Saudi Arabia is uh, very rich and there are a lot of uh, people with money, but uh, you may want to, if you see that uh, uh, there is opportunity, you may want to open it up to some sort of aggregation of smaller amount of money as a crowdsourcing type of a thing so that uh, people who care about uh, developing land in Saudi Arabia uh, could participate where, without having uh, to have a million dollars or half a million dollars or whatever is the price of land to buy. Uh, you could aggregate uh, some smaller money at a later time to uh, have uh, people who care about uh, making Saudi uh, Arabia uh, green uh, could participate by investing $50 or $100 or $500, something like that. I think that's definitely, if we're going to be focusing on the burning need from the landowner side, that's one of the services we'll be able to provide eventually through our platform. Right. It's for the future, I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. That was the very first team and i completely forgot to mention one of the most international ones so we got people from from saudi from south africa palestine and russia in in one team four members for different countries so good job let's move on we got ea stop factor next douglas i'm sorry uh, tyrus yes go ahead Iris, once you're ready. Okay. I uh, don't know if you can see my screen and you can hear me clearly. Yeah. Okay. So I think I should be good to go. Yeah. And sorry, just like another super international team. We got uh, uh, <laughs> Turkey, we got Russia, Korea, and Kenya here. Yes. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Great. So I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay, great. So, hi, all of you. My name is Tyra Zonyeke, uh, representing East Africa Startup Factory. I have my colleagues, Julia, Derek, Sergey, and Goska. So, East Africa Startup Factory is a venture building entity that is trying to redefine how we create startups in our region. Now, there is an African proverb that says, if the wise in the wise, sorry, sorry, guys, a bit of a technical problem. Good. So let me just repeat this. There is an African proverb that says, if the wise elders of the village don't teach the children, the village idiots will certainly do so. Fortunately for us, we are not dealing with idiots, but we are dealing with a substantial lack of experts in the industry partnering with young entrepreneurs to come up with enterprises that take advantage of opportunities in their industry. Now, last year alone, we had roughly around 2 billion worth of VC capital that came to Africa. 25% of this came to Kenya, which is the largest economy in East Africa. 
Interestingly, only 6% of local startups were able to receive funding above 1 million. This exposed a very worrying state in, in that we have startups that are organically grown in this particular region, but are not well structured to be able to take advantage of this VC capital that is flowing in the region. Now, as a solution, uh, one of the biggest advantage we have in the region is that we, we, have, we have a lot of experts with both local and international experience who have years and years of experience accumulated, but they do not have the time or the technical expertise to be able to create ventures that take advantage of opportunities in their field. And on the other hand, we have a big number of very young startups looking for opportunities or looking to get into this particular market, but without direction. So what we are proposing is a formation of a venture building studio that brings the experts and the startups together, giving them financial capital networks to allow them to scale and access global markets. Why now? Globally, the venture building model has shown considerable success, growing by more than 600% over the last seven years, with almost 60% of the startups that come out of these studios accessing Serie A funding. Interestingly, this model has not gotten uh, space within our region. It's still yet to, to, be, to be adopted properly. In terms of the market, as I said, this is the best time to be an investor in Africa. Last year alone, we had 358 uh, unique investors that took part in various transactions. This translated to almost 400% increment from 2017, with majority of the investment going primarily to Nigeria and Kenya, which still remain the sweet spots when it comes to the VC world. Another unique thing about this kind of investment, it has been primarily around the fintech kind of startups. But going forward, however, where we see opportunities around digital agriculture and digital health, where we plan to focus. In terms of the competitive landscape, as I said, I think Africa, we have roughly around 600 uh, hubs of various natures, primarily accelerators and incubators. In East Africa, we have roughly around 60 plus, majority of them offering generic services, but the venture building model is still yet to take stock. Although in the last two years, we have had entrants like Founders Africa and Atel come into this particular space. Now, what is unique about our model? The uniqueness of our venture building model is that we are using industry experts to come up or to identify opportunities that lie in their industry. Using the venture building team, we help them to define the solution. Then we create a team around the MVP. And once we are able to deliver the MVP, we push it through the various funding processes. Our plan is to initially fund the enterprises up to the MVP stage using grants and impact investors at the initial stage. While once we get success stories, we are able to invite angels and VCs thereabout. Our plan is to cash off 50% of our equity, at least in the second round of funding. In terms of our financial projections, we're looking at around 14 million USD in cumulative net income within our first five years from an initial investment of around 600K with our first cash out planned in the first 14 months. We have formed a very good team of local experts around agriculture and health plus entrepreneurship, which will coordinate the idea generation process. This will be backed up by an advisory team that is primarily geared or structured around fundraising, market access, and creation of ecosystems, global ecosystems. Right now, we are asking- Time's up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Feedback, questions, judges? So I, I like this model a lot. Um, and I do think that in a lot of underserved ecosystems, in particular, the couple that you've highlighted here, beyond just the um, beyond just the geography, but even the sectors themselves uh, are conducive to this type of, of venture builder model. I think it's, a, it's it's an interesting one, definitely to pursue. I think the only thing that I would um, encourage you to think more through is um, the operating expenses and the operating budget that you're going to need in order for you to actually be able to sustain yourself for the for the first call it five years, right? Because okay. 
there, there is a fundamental assumption that you're cashing out in 14 months, right? But the reality is that that's, that's slightly out of your control. Mm-hmm. So, so a, a financial model of what you actually think is going to be required to support the team um, that you're going to have to have and the staff that you're going to have to have um, and, and the legwork and the amount of time and the pace with which you can actually absorb some of these things. Um, yes. Just that financial model is what I would really focus on. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then the other question then becomes, if somebody's making an investment in this, um, are they making an investment in, in equity in your venture builder? Or are they making a, a, you know, an investment into a pool of capital that you would then use to support your portfolio? Um, so part of that um, is, is going to be a big question that you're going to have to really think through, right? So, so yeah. the audience of your investors, or your 600,000 that you're looking for, um, mm-hmm. is, is that to buy a stake in your venture builder and then all subsequent equity that that leads to? Is that going to be for primary capital to put into your, um, into your portfolio company? Um, so on and so forth. And, and I think just really thinking through that would be uh, mm-hmm. important. It sounds like you're giving up a piece of your, um, of your overall business for, for the 600,000. Um, yes. Which, which may be necessary. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but I would probably think that you're going to want to think about a, um, two pronged approach here, right? So, so one part Mm -hmm. is, is investment into your studio. And then one part is going to be capital to be invested into your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if Asher is on this call, but he's, he's another great person. And I know he's been a mentor to this uh, group as well. Um, he's another great person to run the economics of this type of model by. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. I do appreciate that. My uh, recommendation, I like the uh, approach also, and obviously this is uh, what we hope uh, will happen in many countries. And uh, GIC is very interested to uh, create a network and help uh, uh, organizations like yourself so move forward. Uh, yes. at the, couple of the things might be that uh, at the beginning, as Pedro said, uh, uh, the, because of all the unknowns and uh, the things that uh, you don't know when uh, any of these startups would uh, become reality that you could get cash flow, uh, you mm-hmm. may want to look into some uh, grant funding uh, or uh, some impact funds. Uh, uh, or some foundations uh, who have a much higher tolerance for uh, uh, development and that uh, they put development as a uh, first priority and uh, IRR as a second priority, like yes. Africa Development Bank, like a World mm-hmm. Bank, like a, a MasterCard Foundation. Uh, highly recommend looking to MasterCard Foundation. Yes. They have mm-hmm. allocated quite a bit of money for creation of uh, jobs um, in uh, Africa. So I would highly recommend uh, uh, check uh, with them also for uh, getting your funding. Uh, they are much more patient and much more forgiving uh, till you guys figure out uh, uh, how to make these things happen. And the uh, second thing uh, uh, I would also uh, recommend is uh, uh, think of uh, scaling up. Uh, how much of these things uh, can you, uh, for example, videotape so you can reuse it uh, so you don't have to uh, keep uh, bringing uh, everything from scratch and uh, mm-hmm. whatever uh, uh, experiences you can capture and uh, mm-hmm. have it be in a form that is uh, digestible, you know, short videos, the things that uh, are relevant. And uh, mm-hmm. as you go through this process, many questions that people have uh, are all uh, repetition. Uh, many frequently asked questions, whatever. So if you could uh, keep thinking of, uh, as you learn uh, how to advise these people, how to help them come along, uh, keep that in mind for scaling mm-hmm. up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Taris and the ES Startup Factory team. Uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna move on to Edumi. So, team that we got five people: uh, three from Moscow, one from Toronto, and one from Antalya. I believe Maria and Aitash, you're gonna be pitching today, right? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Aitash, can you share the, your screen? Sure. 
Um, just a second, I'm just trying to set things up. Okay. Just a kind reminder while we're waiting for the judges is that we're choosing the best team. So just have some notes, make some notes. There is no like, you know, <clears throat> some stuff, just make some notes for yourself. Thank you. Be good to go? Yes. Let's do Hi. it. Hi, I can bet that most of us are located right now in our living rooms, bedrooms, maybe kitchens. But I can also bet that most of you would like this meeting happen in person. Don't you miss those good old days when you could go in person to events, conferences, for those pens, pencils, pins that you would never use, shake hands, meet connection, build connections, meet people, make investment. We are Compass and we are here to tell you that we will meet again. Compass is an online events organization and management platform which offers AR, VR tools in addition to many other sophisticated tools to host events and provide seamless event experience to you. We are here to bring you the conference halls to your living rooms. We talked to 35 customers in, Toronto, in Canada, Turkey, and Russia. And what we heard that they are missing in-person meetings, touching objects, trusting people, and then building long-term business connections. What you're seeing in the background is what Compass looks like, Compass platform looks like. And it's a good market and a good time to invest in uh, this kind of business. Uh, the market uh, that we're trying to target, Asia, European Union, US and Russia are quite lucrative and large. Russian medical and pharmaceutical industry is our widget market. That's where we have our first 10 uh, customers already. Most of, the custom, uh, most of the businesses in events management organization have already partially moved to online. And it's expected that they, even after COVID-19 ends, they will still remain partially online. When we started our competitors, and mind you, this list was much longer, we uh, realized that very few of them offer what we offer, which is AR, VR tools. And very few of them offer booths and displays to host uh, exhibitions and trade shows. Maria? Uh, currently, the campus have already 10 clients, and most of our clients go with us by subscription model, and we measure customer satisfaction quite high, 82%. And already the campus uh, get uh, found from uh, Bortnik found uh, 175,000. And it uh, help us, in the next slide, please, also uh, even uh, ex-Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev use campus. So according to our timeline, we plan to expand geographically and also uh, as well as uh, to develop the, so, uh, the uh, soft platform. So basically we start with uh, building ARVR and then expand the several options in terms of the conference, networking, business cards, chat, video, uh, and enlarge the platform itself uh, year by year. Uh, at first year, we start in Russia and CIS as our um, uh, key market. The, on the second year, we go to European market. And on the third year, we go to Asia and US market. Also, we develop uh, the platform at, we start in this B2B model and then goes to B2C model also to get more clients and to enrich the platform. And also we invest heavily in the marketing and advertising each year and build affiliate program. Next slide, please. And so the finance model uh, built on all uh, this estimation that we have very high customer retention. Also uh, we get for free for big corporate and also for the B2C. And then uh, the customer get together with us and also expand on B2C model on the third year. Uh, so we start to invest in soft, uh, soft development, marketing and advertising. And we estimate the overall turnover over uh, uh, by three years in 17 million. And the cash flow is 6.3 million. And we would like to ask fundraising uh, 1.5 million. The next slide, please. And we have a great team. 
cell campus represented by Vital Ruslan and also have 20 members of development, soft development, sales, and marketing. And we at UME team is an advisory board who consult on experiential learning campus. We all are CPRs, and so we uh, um, put our experience to, to experiential learning, also to test the hypothesis and to do uh, best sales result together with campus. Thank you, and we will meet again. I hope, and we have uh, can share the video after the presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. So perfect timing. Let's move on to the feedback. So I have a question. You mentioned 175,000. Was that investment or your customers actually paying you money to use your service? Uh, currently, so it's investment from Russian scientific found Bortnik and the customer paid us $10,000. So it's existed sales during these three months during the whole program. Okay, that's uh, quite amazing, uh, $10,000. Uh, so that's real customers uh, who real used customers, it yeah. and uh, they were happy with your service. Yeah, and so it's medical equipment companies who already started to use it because of the COVID period, because it was really quite, um, how to say, tough for them to sell the equipment without all this event and shows. Uh, one recommendation I would have is uh, to highlight that as a profile of a, a customer and the fact that you actually did uh, receive uh, money and if you have any testimonials from the customer and the experiences they have had, uh, it would be uh, quite uh, uh, important. Uh, second thing I would say in your financial protect, uh, projections, uh, uh, you are uh, having too many numbers and digits and zeros and whatever and uh, life is not so perfect it's full of unknowns and uh, projecting something for 2023 uh, as uh, you know so many millions of dollars and so many uh, thousands and so many dollars itself or whatever is uh, uh, it uh, does not it says that you have engineering background not finance background so I would round it up and uh, show it as a uh, you know, <clears throat> use just K or M for millions or uh, thousands or whatever and uh, uh, make it easier for people to follow and uh, round it up. Uh, uh, I think uh, that would uh, show more uh, financial sophistication on that side. Thank you a lot for the feedback. Yeah, so we will yeah, develop, I just, we have the opportunity to develop. <laughs> I, having, I remember in my first company when I started that uh, I, uh, my five-year projection and cash flow projection, I, my first meeting with their VCs was, I said that we only need $732,486.56. And he said that, uh, can we just round it up and give you $487? And I said, no, 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 we don't need a penny more. And uh, we are going to be profitable and uh, do this. Uh, and having raised 20 more million dollars after that, we still were not profitable, so. <laughs> thank you for the joke, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I got yeah, the it would also It would also help, I think, in your presentation to discuss the unit economics of how this actually works and what the business model is. You didn't really talk about that. And uh, that, that'll help investors understand how this business actually works and uh, you know you seem to have made great progress. Uh, also, uh, you'll want to add stuff around how the AR VR technology actually works, and and what the platform is actually doing. So when you have time, when you have an opportunity for a longer presentation, you can add that stuff in, and uh, it'll add a lot of clarity. Uh, and as Cameron said, putting the voice of the customer in the presentation is really important. You want to do that. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Thank you for the feedback. And we have so many slides in the appendix and just deleted just before I, the presentation. I, I understand that five minutes is not long enough to give a proper presentation. Yeah. Thank you. So in the um, quick minute here that we have left, um, the number one thing that takes 
takes a story or a narrative out of the land of hypothetical into the world of reality is, is traction. And, and clearly you've, you've already demonstrated that, but unfortunately, um, to Kamran's point earlier, um, and, and to Mike's point uh, re regarding the product, it's, it's a little bit ambiguous in terms of what exactly you've accomplished. Um, and it's almost as though you're, you're kind of hiding it almost, right? And you're talking about the bigger perspective, but you haven't really highlighted the most important thing, which is somebody's actually been willing to pay you to do something for them, which is tremendous. Um, the, the thing I would encourage you to, to, to consider is, is really highlighting that traction and highlighting why was it that people actually paid you the money and what is it that they paid you the money for, right? So, so highlighting um, what exactly is the, is the unit economic, uh, the unit economics behind that transaction. So, you know, was it 175 from one customer? Was it 17 different customers giving you $10,000? Like what was going on there? And then, um, Instead of using generic imagery, I would I would encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity to highlight your product's imagery inside of it, so that at least as you're describing all the other things over it, we're, we're seeing what you're selling. Okay. Um, so that would be the other way by which you can bake in that into your um, into your narrative. But but great job and and uh, and definitely timely. Thank you very much, Pedro. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the feedback. Thank you. All right, that was a Demi team. Let's move on. We got Phil from Saudi Arabia. The whole team is from Jeddah. Three people in there. And I believe Amr, you will be pitching today, right? Yes, I will. Thank you. Okay, can I go? Let's do it. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Amr. I have Felwa with me and uh, Tamim, and we are Phil. We are all sports enthusiasts, and we entered the offline sports sector early this year. We found the need and decided to launch a digital solution to merge the offline and the online experiences. So FEEL is a digital solution for outdoor and sports uh, adventure and businesses, which will provide a seamless integration between real and digital experiences in the world of sports and adventures. The Saudi market in the sports sector uh, has been growing uh, with key fundamentals. Uh, we've, we started the company with the focus on developing sports destinations and executing sports events, and we've successfully executed a couple of events the FIBA Asia Cup qualifiers beginning of the year, and most recently a national climbing event. We've also reached out and engaged with many sports clubs and federations to understand how the business works and to uh, see what issues are they facing. Uh, some of the major issues they're facing is the listing of activities and the management of booking. There's also the problem of the database management and uh, the lack of a CRM system. We've also had a major issue with payment. They would usually uh, accept wire transfers and cash on site. Uh, they would do most of their marketing on social media and WhatsApp groups, and they face difficulties in connecting and engaging with their uh, club members. So solving the above issues will optimize their back-end operations of the business and increase their ability to scale up. So Field's value proposition is to provide an initial white label solution that attracts operators through, their, uh, through solving their operational needs. By providing this, these features, we will enable operators to uh, utilize up-to-date visibility on their business, helping them make decisions for optimization and scalability. This is just a sample prototype of our platform. This is actually a, a club's website. This is the dashboard on the left. You'll have in the middle of the calendar and the, below that some of the activities they, uh, they provide. Clicking on all these events will take you to uh, more details about this event. And on the right side, you can book or even pay online on the same website. So our advantage is uh, being an, uh, an offline company moving online. We think this gave us the advantage of understanding the customer needs. Also being one of the first movers uh, gave us uh, the staying ahead by offering the white label solution to help the customer build their own brand. 
and of course the convenience of helping the company uh, focus on their core business and uh, manage their while we manage their non service their non core services. So our product development strategy is starting with the MVP, uh, offering SaaS for those uh, sports clubs. Uh, uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the later stage, we want to onboard those clubs in our own platform. So becoming a marketplace, attracting those clubs by listing additional services, promotional services, and access to a wider network of suppliers and access to other premium features. Today, we're working on developing the product, the architecture and development of the product. Within three months, we should launch our, own, uh, our MVP. Within six months, we should have more than 25 clubs uh, using our software. In one year, we should have 60 clubs uh, with 15,000 users across our clubs and reach a 2.3 million uh, total transactional value. Uh, business model is a B2B model, so providing the SaaS solution for the clubs which will enable them to uh, list their trips and manage their bookings, and we will charge a 5% commission per transaction. Uh, in this pre-seed round, we're asking for $250,000 uh, with a runway of 12 months. We will use these funds for uh, mostly for product development and OPEX, and the rest will go to marketing. And we should reach, within the 12 months, a validated product, having 60 clubs used in our software, and a transactional value of 2.3 million. The team, myself as the CEO and head of sales, uh, my experience is in finance and business planning. We also have Sigurd, who's uh, ex-Red Bull, head of global sports. Sigurd has massive experience in uh, executing events and sports marketing. We have Felwa, our digital marketing expert, who, who has experience in brand development and the company's identity. We also have Tamim, who's our project manager, with experience in feasibility studies and financial analysis. Thank you. Great timing. Good job. Thanks. Judges, to you. So I'm, I'm happy to start this time. Um, so this is, this is a really um, interesting opportunity. Um, and I think one of the things that I would encourage you to think about is um, really highlighting what it is that you're trying to do at the beginning, not at the end. And so you mentioned at the, at the end that you, you're you really focused on being B2B. Um, a couple of things to think about, right? Like, are you B2B or are you B2B2C? And that was a piece of it that I was somewhat kind of wrestling with in, in, in my head all the way through until you kind of came to the, to the final statement there. And the reason I say that is because in many cases, um, a lot of the value accrues to the to the owners of the eventual eyeballs, right? So, so are you dictating the spend on the end customers, or are you actually kind of like more of a Shopify, where where you're just a, basically a platform that no one really sees, right? So the end customer never really knows who Field is, and all you're really doing is just basically providing infrastructure for the people that then go and do the marketing and the sales on that on that front. In many cases, and, and what I've seen in terms of like, for example, the tourism industry is um, a few different platforms that, that sort of popped up in the Bay Area focused on, on something like this. And, and the reality was as much as they needed that platform to, to manage their business because it was just too expensive to build everything from scratch. Um, the bigger pain point was, was um, expertise and, or lack thereof in marketing. And so what they actually wanted was for these platforms to not only help them sort of navigate and, and sort of construct their website, but also use the collective power of reach across all the different places that they were um, serving and supplying to bring additional eyeballs into their platform as well. And that's something to really think about, right? Like, is it, is it really foundationally at the, at the core problem of these businesses? Is it infrastructure, right? So is it just technology and coding and just lack of engineering talent they have in-house or is it that plus eyeballs right and i would guarantee you that that almost everybody that you're going to be talking to their their their, their eyes are going to light up as soon as you say i can also offer you additional eyeballs the problem with that is that then it puts you in a little bit of a conflict as to who who actually owns that that end relationship with the market but but i think it's it's worthwhile for you to explore that a little bit further and come to your own like strong conclusions. And maybe it's the exact same thing as you're presenting right now, but just something to think about, right? 
is, is if you do own a little bit more of that, that end user um, relationship, you can accrue a lot more value and provide a lot more value to these small subscale businesses. Just something to think about. Thank you. Uh, another quick comment. Um, it, it would make the presentation, I think, a lot clearer if you started out basically saying that this is something like it's a go-to-market platform for all these clubs. And you, you started out in this, uh, gee, we're going to integrate real and digital experiences and all this kind of stuff, and which, which confused me. I, I, I think if you started in right away on this whole notion of figuring out how to support all these clubs, for doing all these various activities, it would be uh, much clearer what your actual business is right like right away. Because in an investor presentation, you want the investors to understand what you're doing in like the first 60 seconds. And so th think of, think about flipping some stuff around Flip here. It, yes. uh, yeah, and, and then, um, you know, putting some stuff in on a, on a business model for how this thing uh, you know, actually is going to work. So just some things to think about. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, Amr, I had a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, three or four people uh, in your team, were they all part of this uh, cohort that, that uh, you worked together or did you have other people uh, that were not part of your team that uh, worked with you on this uh, uh, two of the team actually work with me in, uh, in this cohort, yes, but uh, one, is, uh, one does not, no. Oh, okay. So uh, you, this was uh, primarily your team came as the three of you uh, to go through this thing. And, uh, okay, just exactly. wanted to understand that. Good. Yeah. I agree with the comments that uh, Pedro and uh, Mike made. Uh, they make a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, team. Thank you so much, Amr and the team, the field team. Guys, we're going to have a small break for five minutes. So let's be back here by 10 minutes, uh, wherever time zone you're in. So like uh, for me, it's 6.10. For the California guys, I believe it's 9.10 a.m. No, 8.10. It's 8.10. Okay, 8.10 a.m. All right. So let's, let's be back in five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Five or ten? It's five. Five. It's close to five. Five minutes. Five minutes, but uh, ten minutes in the. Okay. Yeah. On the watches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Sure, Sigi. Yes, it was interesting. Joke was a uh, the kind of anecdote from. A uh, lecturer, uh, professor who lectured to a mixed uh, Russian, non-Russian uh, group in MBA program. And after he finished uh, uh, he uh, one hour and uh, switched to a break, he announced in English, uh, he said, oh no, in Russian, he said uh, 10 minutes break. In English, he said 15 minutes break. <laughs> <laughs> That's very specific joke. I see. <laughs> Uh, about time, time uh, understanding. Yes. <laughs> time perception. We have an international in the five minutes break, and Rosan actually started already the timer with his video. <laughs> oh, sorry, I have to run <laughs> for my coffee. <laughs> Good. You got three minutes and forty seconds left. Actually, more.
Hey, JC. You came to support your team, Technoprice. It's going to be in one. So one team and then after that, Technoprice. All right, are we all back? Let me see. We got Cameron, Pet. Okay, we got Mike. I cannot see Pedrom yet. So once Pedrom is back, we can start. We can continue. We got four more teams. I would just kindly remind you that some of the teams they are they consist of the CPIs in training as well as the participants. We got 48 participants out of which 28 are CPIs in training. As some of them already mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Pedram is here. Okay, I believe we can go on. Pure Mart, you guys ready? Yeah, ready. Okay. So feel free to share the screen. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Fadi. I'm 33 years old. And both my wife and I work long hours and often only meet for one meal a day, typically dinner. So as we aspire to eat better, we try to do our best and cook meals at home versus uh, ordering out. But once we get home, none of us has the energy to cook, mainly because balanced meals involve fresh ingredients, which need time and effort to be prepared. And um, after doing a little research and sending out surveys, my team and I found out that many people actually feel the same. So here's, here's some stats. Prepping ingredients is the number two reason people tend not to cook and opt for ordering out. That's number two because number one is doing dishes and nobody likes to do dishes. We also found that 81% of respondents would cook more uh, more often if, ingre if their ingredients were ready to, to be cooked. And 85% of respondents would consume more fresh fruits and vegetables if they were washed and cut for them. So what's the environment like? In our city of Jeddah, there's no place that consolidates all the high quality fresh produce available on the market. The shopping experience hasn't evolved in the last 40 years. And when you do find high quality produce, it's mostly imported while all the local high quality produce is found in scattered sources. So um, doing further market research, we found that the uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetable uh, consumption in Saudi Arabia is a $10 billion market with the Western region where Jeddah is representing a third of that with a total serviceable market of $300 million. So we decided to establish Pure Mart, your one-stop shop for fresh goodies every day. Pure Mart wants to elevate the quality of produce and convenience of eating better. So Pure Mart will provide ready-to-eat and ready-to-cook fruits and vegetables, ready-to-eat mixes for those customers, uh, ready-to-eat mixes, sorry, and for those customers who still prefer to prep on their own, Pure Mart will provide sourced, selected, and pre-packed fruits and vegetables. Pure Mart will source its product from local hydroponic and organic farms, as well as from local importers and wholesalers. The Pure Mart teams will then sort and select the best of the produce, wash, peel, cut, and pack those in its own processing unit. And then the Pure Mart products will be available for sale first in the Pure Mart store, which will also deliver a one-of-a-kind experience with its unique vegetable butcher, where customers can pick pre-packed produce and have it prepped to their liking live. Pure Mart will also be available online through the Pure Mart app, <clears throat> the website, and third-party delivery apps. Finally, Pure Mart will also offer subscription boxes where customers can personalize the contents and the, del and the delivery frequency um, of those boxes. So recapping here, Pure Mart will be the first on the market to deliver this level of convenience, will forge strategic relationships with local farms and enable them to access new markets, provide the vegetable butcher service and concept, which is one of a kind. And finally, and last but not least, consolidating premium and high quality produce in one place. So here's what our journey looks like so far. We've secured a strategic offtake agreement with an organic and hydroponic farm. We've secured a location for the store. We've completed the store design, completed our branding and identity design, secured our machinery, equipment, and packaging, and held panel discussions and focus groups to grasp what customers actually are looking for. And moving forward into 2021, we expect to complete our store and website and go live in the first quarter. 
So what are we asking for here? We need a million dollars to complete the building of the processing unit, build the online platform, and hire the human resources necessary to operate the project. Our projections estimate that at a horizon of 18 months, we will reach 100 customers a day with an average basket of $30 for total annualized sales of a million dollars and a bottom line of about 20%. Our next step at year two is to expand to the capital Riyadh and Dammam on the East Coast through the opening of flagship store in each of these cities, engage in other food groups and grow our teams to support the expansion. Now, our team is made of ex-corporate bankers, strategy consultants and agricultural specialists, all extremely excited to have embarked on this journey to help people eat better, easier. Thank you. Great job. 30 seconds left. Let's go on. Judges, to you. Well, uh, I want to compliment you on a very compelling presentation. And uh, how did how long did you guys work on this? This is uh, quite professionally done, uh, right to the point, and a uh, uh, great job. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate the feedback. So the same question as I ask uh, from uh, the field team. Uh, how many of uh, your team were in this cohort and uh, uh, how long ago did you guys start to work with each other? Uh, okay, so our team, uh, basically, uh, Hattan and I have known each other, I think, for eight years. We worked in a bank together and now we've been working on this project now um, for about two years. This is an actual uh, real, real project. It's not just for the cohort. It's actually a business that we're moving forward with. Um, all the information in the presentation is accurate. Um, the store is actually under construction and um, slated to, to, to open in the, in the first quarter of 2021. Um, and the rest of the team have also been with us. Um, we've, I've, we've also known them for a long time. Um, and we've been actually working on this project for, for about a year now. And that both you and Hatam are, are uh, part of the cohort, or are you the only one who is on the cohort? No, no, we're, we're all in the cohort. Oh, all of you are in the cohort. Well, yeah. very well done. Great job. Yeah. Yeah, great presentation. Re really exciting. Um, and uh, <clears throat> essentially, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a supply chain an interesting supply chain integration play, where, uh, you know, it it really is, um, I think, useful. the the only The only questions that may come up maybe, on the user side, are, um, uh, you know, how how long after after the green butcher gets through doing all this stuff, uh, does this degrade the life the lifetime of the product? Or, you know, uh, what what does the customer need to do to extend the life of this stuff so that they have it in their refrigerator properly done and all that good stuff, so that uh, uh, the product doesn't uh, degrade too quickly. Um, so, typically, the the green butcher would um, process uh, quantities that um, a customer could also buy uh, readily processed. Uh, typically. Uh, the same day um, but we have the green butcher um, to be frank for the show so you would definitely have people you know that would be uh, thinking that no I don't trust people cleaning my vegetables or so on because this is a new concept so having that in your store and having people actually see the process and trust the process would then move them to ordering online and not really needing to come to the store that's why when we said that we would expand to uh, the other other cities we would only need one flagship store in each of the cities just to also have that magnet and then most great of the idea online yeah no that's good thank you thank you um i i think i think this is a really clever idea um and uh it it somewhat sounds gimmicky, but but at the same time, it it doesn't matter because you're you're a direct to consumer product, so so you do need to have a little bit of a storytelling edge to you, which which I think you do, which is great. Um, th this is a this is a very much of an economic proposition here, though. So so I think you know as as you're talking about the million dollar need, I think the the important thing here is is to take some of the 
the arithmetic out of it. So I think you mentioned that you're trying to get to a hundred people, a hundred customers a day, I think yeah. was, was one of the things you're striving for. Right. And so, so as soon as I see, like a person like me sees a number like that, is I, as I start doing math, right. So I just say, okay, well, what's, what's the average basket size? If I can assume 50 us dollars yeah. times a hundred, now it's like 5,000. So it's 5,000 a day. Then how many, you know, what does that look like on a monthly basis? You know, and, I, and I'm just now starting to do some calculations in my head, you know, several hundred thousand dollars of, of throughput per month. Um, you know, what's, what's the head count, what's the margin structure. So I think, um, you know, give, given the fact that you're orienting towards a, um, an investor audience, um, packing in a little bit more of those details just to kind of say, you know what, that there's a, an economic model here that's sustainable um, would be worthwhile. The other thing that I would really encourage you to, to do is, um, and I, and I know this is, this is challenging, but, but there's some expertise that we have access to, and I'd be happy, happy to make some introductions for you, um, that are teams that are designed to do market research in advance of restaurant launches in particular restaurant chains, not just like a mom and pop, you know, kebab shop, but, but like an actual chain kind of thing. Um, and bringing some of that expertise in house, um, whether on a consulting basis or part of your advisory team or what have you, I think is important at this stage because there are some very, very detailed demographic and user studies that they do before they launch a brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and some of those statistics are, high, are, are missing from your presentation, right? The, the, the market validation statistics. So I know you're very, very close to this and in launching this. If you've done this already, great. Then highlight all those you know, stats in there. And if you haven't, then I, I'd encourage you to really do that so that you nail your proposition um, at the time of your, you know, big launch. Uh, yeah. This there, there is a deep science behind launching of these types of um, physical brands, right? And you can think about this being no different than a than a restaurant, right? Chain. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so do take advantage of all the all the work and and the background that all these you know uh, established ecosystems have taken care of. Sure, um, I, I absolutely agree. Um, we don't have time, Fadi. Uh, really sorry, but this is the time is over, and uh, I think you know if you have any feedback to, to to provide or any answer that you want to provide to Pedro, maybe just write on the direct message. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all for the feedback. Really. Thank you, Pure Martin. Let's move on. The Techno Price. Who is gonna present? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Let me share my presentation. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. It should be black. Yeah, it should be black, Mike. I see you're nodding, but this is this is this is how it should start. Okay. Great. Irene, let's do it. Okay. Great. Thank you. As a society, we have become a very visual world. To communicate, trillions of images are being used on a daily basis on websites, mobile applications. Look at this slide, what do you see? Exactly nothing. This is, this is what the internet looks like to people who are blind or have other disabilities. 15% of the global population lives with some form of disability and struggle to use technology every day. Each of us in this room knows someone who has a disability. It can be your brother with a mobility impairment, your aunt who might be blind, your sister who might have autism, your neighbor who maybe has Parkinson's. And how crazy is it that in 2020, with all the technological advancement, they they still struggle to use a basic website or mobile application. What we are talking about here is access to basic needs, such as healthcare, education, and banking. Technology makes life much easier for people with disabilities. The problem is that companies lack awareness, expertise, processes to make their digital products and services accessible to the 15% of the global population who have disabilities. 
Let me give you a simple example. Look at this banking up, uh, website. In order to access your bank account, you need to submit your ID and your password and then click submit. Unfortunately, you need to use a mouse to be able to click submit. However, people who are blind and those with limited mobility only use a keyboard and not a mouse. So something as simple as clicking the submit button will deny you access to your bank account. My name is Irene um, Barry Kirika. I'm the founder of Technoprice and we, we created Technoprice to empower organizations to design and build digital products and services that are inclusive to all people. We offer different types of services that start with understanding and identifying compliance issues on clients' uh, websites and mobile applications. Then we work with clients on designing and fixing the issues and verifying the issues have been fixed and coming up with a maintenance plan. The main benefits of disability are many. One of them is an untapped market. The 15% of the disability market is a massively growing pool of digital consumer, and there's a chance of increased revenues for businesses. At the same time, it can be costly. If your products are not accessible, the law can easily catch up with you. There's great public relations in having uh, accessible digital products because there's an increase in awareness and marketing, which leads to increased revenues. There's also indirect beneficiaries from this, uh, from this investment. People who are, your product becomes more usable. So we have people who are the elderly who benefit from this, people who are in the low bandwidth areas and people who are illiterate also benefit from digital accessibility. We charge per platform, web platform, USSD, mobile app, and we also focus on the various types of disabilities, which include the blind, the deaf or mobility. In 2020, we closed on nine projects and we made $36,000. In 2021, we hope to close on 170 projects and to make $700,000. A minimum deal that we work on is $4,000. The digital accessibility market globally represents $23 billion. Starting out, we will focus on the, ge on the geographic area that we are most familiar with, which is the East African region and, and Nigeria. Our competitors are massively overseeing three things that we are facing. We are among the first to focus on Africa and, and, and providing unique services. A good example is we are offering USSD testing, which is an extremely impro important product, digital platform for making payments uh, on mobile applications in Africa. We have an amazing team with 15 years of experience in the digital, uh, in the disability and accessibility space, in the tech startups and business development in the African market. We have a beautiful problem and we have clients, but our issue right now is, is that we don't have a, a big enough team to grow the, the business. That is why we are trying to raise $600,000, which will allow us to have a one year runway. The majority of these funds will be spent on growing and expansion. 25% will go into system development and 25 into operations. Not only have we proven that our business model works, we are also in the business of doing good. We invite you to join us on our journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene and the Tech Prize team. Judges, perfect timing as always. Judges. Well, uh, this camera and I have a question. Uh, how much of uh, the work that you have done so far uh, can uh, really be scaling up? Uh, uh, Two things caught my mind. First of all, uh, uh, my hearty congratulations on uh, uh, the work that you are doing and is absolutely needed. Uh, and uh, second of all, uh, it is uh, really good to see that uh, you guys are uh, uh, tackling this uh, in uh, uh, with a big vision. And my question is how much of this is uh, driven by uh, uh, the headcount, the number of people that uh, you have, and especially $600,000 uh, to spend it in one year says that, uh, uh, I could be wrong, but says that you are going to hire quite a few people to make this happen. How much are you really leveraging uh, the technology to make this to become um, uh, possible to scale it up and make it be a cookie cutter type of a business so that... Uh, uh, you know, you don't have to do customization each time. Um, 
I'll, I'll take part of the question and um, Douglas will take the rest of it. So yes, most of the budget will go into hiring and training people. One of the challenges we face in this space is that everything is very technical and the user has been very ignored. So you find that in the digital accessibility space, we've automated some of the tools we can use to test. But so far globally, the tools can only identify 30% of the issues. So you actually need uh, people people with disabilities to sit down and test this program, uh, these products to be able to give proper user feedback. So that's part of where the funding will go. Yeah. Uh, so as, as Irene had stated, um, and uh, actually you are correct that uh, we need a lot of people uh, because uh, there has actually been a situation whereby you are given a particular a request by a client but the only thing that's limiting you is the number of people that are uh, working for you so for us to be able to break even with the numbers that we are targeting the first year it's inevitable that we'll have to increase uh, the number of people who are working for us can i add something quickly to that um just as another point so um, I think it's also what is quite interesting is that people with disabilities, especially in Africa, actually struggle to get jobs. So I, we do think that part of it, what is interesting is that it's also really a job creator for these type of people as well. That was great uh, answer, Claudio. <laughs> Any other feedback? Um, sure. I, I think uh, just just echoing what what Kamran was saying. One one of the points that I that I kind of struggled with a little bit on this was was understanding whether or not this was going to be a product organization or a service organization, and and I think it's um, it's it's a challenge in many cases that that not just um, it pertains to this story, but 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 also a lot of different opportunities. Where, where it's really hard to, to figure out if, if there is a scalable product behind the services concept. Um, and, and at some point, you either need to validate that, that you can turn this into a product or just be very, very comfortable that you're building a services organization. Um, as such, that tightrope that you're walking right now in terms of fundraising and, and, and sort of what you're aspiring to build, um, you, you, you at some point are going to need to figure out how to navigate it and get to the other side, right? Because um, what I would encourage you to do in the, in, the, in the near term is to really figure out if there is a scalable product or if this is going to be um, effectively a services company longer term. Um, because that, to, to, to me, kind of reading between the lines here in your presentation, I think that that, that tension um, persists. And, 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 un and until you can figure out how to solve it, it's going to be very difficult to fundraise um, because the question then becomes, what are you putting money into, right? And, and what are you really aspiring to do? Um, you, could, you could raise a smaller amount of money and say, well, we're going to raise that money to go figure out if we can build a product or if we're going to continue to become more uh, bespoke and services oriented. But I think even your answer to Kamran was, was indicating the fact that you still haven't quite figured out the challenges and the nuances of making this a repeatable um, self-serve kind of thing, right? So, which is which is not a um, it's not a knock against the idea, or the proposition, or the solution, or anything, right? It's just more of a business construct that you're going to need to to just become comfortable with and figure out. You know what 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 are you, right? Are you are you a bird? Are you a reptile? Are you a animal? Are you furry? Like what 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 are you aspiring to be longer term? Um, which could change. But, but it, it needs to be cemented in the, in, in the investor's mind as, as to how it is that they can help support you. One thing that uh, uh, I was uh, you know, thinking of uh, based on Claudio's market, uh, I'm Claudio's comment, uh, you may uh, position this as a job creator for the disabled people and also making lives of a much bigger people a bigger population as well. So you're killing two birds with one and uh, make it be as a service organization uh, and uh, go into getting grants uh, from development organizations because you are doing two things. You are helping uh, uh, creating a lot of jobs for uh, uh, 
disabled people and second you're using those people to find the solutions that would benefit uh, 10 times number of people or 100 times or a thousand times uh, other people so that could be pre pretty compelling uh, uh, thing is that uh, you employ x number of people say 20 people or 100 people but uh, that use them uh, to solve problems of a million uh, disabled people thank you so much judges thank you the techno prize team let's move on we got yatir coming next so team is from palestine from different part of palestine i believe said or rabab who's going to be pitching yes rabab cool let me know once you're ready we're ready let's do Hello it everyone i'm rabab and we're yatair once upon a time those were the words my grandmother started with before every bedtime at hers when the story ended she asked me now you know why you shouldn't cry wolf wolf with technology now being the main driver of our everyday life, we have identified inadequate accessibility of Arabic digital content. And with the Arab speakers now that are not solely limited to the Arab countries due to relocation and migration, this resulted in a cultural detachment. Parents are always seeking new ways to educate and expose their kids to values, their origins, and remain connected to their mother language not to miss the limited availability of technology, educational tools, addressing the behavioral tendency of kids in an indirect fine, fun manner. That's where Yatair idea originated. Yatair is an application that narrates folk tales and modern stories in mother language, presented in a high quality sound production. The application will act as a messaging medium from parents to children, interfaced by a story theme that with a unique character. The folk tales will bring children closer to their roots while modern behavioral stories will help educate them, focusing on mindfulness to help children relax before going to sleep. As a parent before bedtime, I launched the app. My child will choose a story while, ho while holding the story character stuffed toy. And I put the phone aside Yatair stories would help the child calm down and sleep. Our market is targeted to the Arab speaking population. As a beachhead, we will focus on the regions of the US and Europe. Taking a look at is what's out there. No competitors combine the two aspects of Arabic language and mindfulness for children. In order to put things into perspective, let's look at the big picture. First, we have the stories content and sound production delivered through mobile application to our target customers, Arabic speaking parents. The cultural education and influential partners will help us reach those customers. Our business model is a B2C. We will also target selling labeled goods of the stories, characters and figures. Our subscription based freemium model will provide various premium buckets the users could pick from. Earlier this week, we launched our landing page, enabling subscribers to receive updates on the app releases. We created our MVP demo story, shared it through closed targeted groups and collected feedback. Next, we will be working on and improving our MVP based on the customer's feedback. Our alpha version of the application is targeted in one year. Meanwhile, we will be working on enriching our stories catalog during that period. In two years, we are targeting a base of 30,000 customers, of which 10,000 are subscribers, aiming to expand our reach to the Gulf region. We aim to reach those target customers' numbers through social media, reaching well-established Arab communities, and utilizing the customer base of our cultural and educational partners. Our seed investment request is $250,000. In order to acquire 10,000 customers, over the period of 19 months. Our funding will be spent over story production, development, sales, and operations. Our team gathers more than eight years of different experiences, both in business and high-tech worlds. Starting with our CEO, Shehab, 
an expert in giving life to businesses. Saeed, our CTO with experience in Intel and Qualcomm and a social entrepreneur. Rula, our marketing specialist with a vast experience in social media, marketing, design, and content. And I, Rabab, an expert, an, exper an expert in envisioning and developing interactive products. We are Yatayr. We bring your kids Arabic narrated stories with a grandmother experience, addressing cultural and behavioral tendency with an indirect educational messages in a fun manner. We have a surprise, a taste of the narration style and sound production. Hope you enjoy. Sorry. أخمض عينيك وتنفس بعمق أين الوسادة؟ نحضنها وننام لنسافر هناك Thank you Thank you so much, Shabab Wow, great presentation <laughs> Very compelling again Good job Thank you So how many of your team uh, were in the cohort? Uh, we're all in the cohort, basically. So it's Shahab, Saeed, and Rula as well. Uh, we, they're on the call here as well. Wow, great team, great job. Thank you. So I'm, I'm part of your target audience. Um, Unfortunately, I don't speak Arabic, but but if I did, I would definitely be a a, a, a principal user of this type of service. Um, I think anything that is in the market around um, the age group that you're talking about has a has an infinite appetite um, for spend from parents. So I think it, it, it's one of those things where if if you build it and if you and if you build it correctly, you you have an an extremely large market opportunity and the fact that you you're, you're catering to um, an audience with, with a particular language, which is widely used across many different regions gives you an extremely large audience to go after as well. Um, so I think, I think this is great. Um, the, the things that I would, would really consider is and I, I, the piece of it that I, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe it was, I just didn't quite catch it was the, uh, uh, what is the, the steady state business model that you're trying to um, to achieve here? Is, is this going to be pure digital? Is it sort of pure digital with we you know with with high margin physical products that you're selling? You know what what exactly is is your prioritization of how you're going to roll this out, and, and what do you need to have in place? Um, you don't need to answer this. I'm just kind of giving you sort of a sense of my feedback on this. I because I, I get the whole picture of what you're trying to do, and I'm just wondering. If you were to do this, you know, one bite at a time, um, what would be the first couple of bites that you would take, and 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 how would you then be able to um, deliver as much value in in a, in a comprehensive solution with with whatever your first two things are that you're going to do? Longer term, I absolutely see this as becoming quite interesting. Um, one final kind of thought here, and maybe a final note is. To really also think about um, from a marketing perspective, who's the audience you're going after? If, if it's if it's parents, if it's children, if it's you know what it is, and just make sure that um, your your marketing, your branding, and your positioning is is consistent all the way through. Um, and the only reason I say that is because just looking at your final slide here, right? This 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 doesn't scream at me as being something that you'd want to be for for children, right? This this kind of is is more of a daunting murder of crows, scaring the bejesus out of young kids more, more than something that I'd want to put them to bed with. So, so just kind of consistency in terms of everything that you do and you say, I think was, is, it, it, it will be, um, it will be helpful to establish your brand and your presence as well, right? Longer term. But I, I think, I think this is great. And I think, you know, you, you'll have an infinite market to go after. And I would say also that uh, if you don't have connection to, for example, Kadumi Foundation, uh, uh, 
we would be happy to make introductions to you guys. I think this could be something that they would be very supportive of or uh, many other uh, organizations uh, that uh, care about, uh, uh, I mean, you guys are really doing uh, two great things. The one is uh, doing something to help uh, uh, the kids uh, uh, and also making the parents happy that their kids are learning about Arabic and uh, they are, uh, uh, they're going to sleep in a nice way or whatever. So, actually, Kamran, we're part of the Hani Kadumi Foundation. We're sponsored by them, and yesterday we were on the team in the back end. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. It was a great right. talk. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you, thank Excellent. you, Kamran. This is wonderful. Thank you for I, I knew Dr. Nabil would love this, and uh, <laughs> so that's fantastic. Okay. You, you might also emphasize more right up front that uh, this is a children's education platform. And it, um, I must have missed it right at the very beginning, but it, it did, didn't pop out. And you know, that's, that's really the focus. And I think you, should, you wanna say that right up front. So it's very clear who your target audience is. Thank you so much, uh, Yati, Yati team and uh, the judges. Let's move on. So now we got last but not least, Wendo, Africa. And the floor is yours. Looks like you're all ready. Yep, Hello. ready to go. Let's do it. Good luck. Okay. Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Helena, and today I'll be presenting Wendo, Africa. Mm. If my slides would change. Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> so I want to start by introducing you to Angela. Angela is a young professional in Kenya's busy capital city, Nairobi. She has a friend's birthday coming up and she wants to get her something thoughtful and unique, but she doesn't have endless hours to be scrolling on social media, looking from vendor pages to vendor page. She's also not sure if the products she's seeing are a good deal, right? Is she getting something that's within her budget? Might there be better somewhere else? Overall, she feels like she doesn't have good information to make an informed decision. Angela just ends up walking to her local mall, buying some imported pretty item. It's not what she wanted to do, but it solved her problem. Although I think we can do better for her. So the solution is Wendo. Wendo is an online aggregator of curated and high quality products from the Kenyan creative economy. We solve the frustrating problem of finding a unique treat for yourself or a gift for a loved one online. We actually started thinking we were going to be a gift focused platform but through our customer discovery and market research realized that people were willing to spend a few extra coins for something nice for themselves so pivoted to a more general um, aggregator of the creative economy we focus on non-perishable items so things like textiles leather goods home accessories our solution works like pretty much any other e-commerce platform the customer will order from the comfort of their home the order goes to the vendor uh, in this case mama and jerry um, she is actually our economic buyer, so she'll pay us a subscription every month. For that subscription, she will get access to be featured on the platform, strategic ad placement, and will also receive great customer feedback and insights to improve her product. Um, once the product is ready, we'll ship it back to uh, our customer who will who'll benefit from convenient quality and on-time delivery. Um, we do have a version 1.0 of our website, thanks to one of our IX uh, classmates, thank you, Said, um, where you can see a few of our products here. We wanna start this business in Nairobi and there's a reason for it. Nairobi is a big city, 4 million population. There's about 600,000 professional young women there. This is an aspirational group of people who'd like to buy nice things for themselves and their loved ones. Um, what makes this market interesting is the high mobile penetration and the proliferation of the mobile money system in PESA means that the growing, the e-commerce ecosystem has really exploded. You see that from the market size in 2020, $1 billion, that was a 65% year on year growth. The ARPU here is about $70. And of course, in a market this fertile, there, there'll be a lot of competition. From here, you might recognize the uh, platform Jumia, sometimes known as the Amazon of Africa. They focus on mass market and imported goods, so primarily cheap stuff from China. Uh, and while there are, of course, a plethora of e-commerce platforms, we're really interested in playing in the space of made in Kenya, focusing on niche markets and handmade. Where we think we can really differentiate ourselves is, again, key focus on localization, a deep customer intimacy and understanding of what our users are looking for and offering a range of handmade high quality products. 
Uh, as far as our go-to-market, we have two different ones, one for vendors and one for customers. So coming back to Mama and Jerry, we want to focus on small vendors with no social media presence. So really we come to them as a digital marketing agency. We'll put their products online, we'll help them get more eyeballs. And so we'll reach these vendors through entrepreneur societies and just going to flea markets and talking to the artisans making beautiful products. Uh, as far as our timeline, we are currently in an aggressive market test. We've onboarded a few products and started our social media accounts, but post the holiday Q1 of next year, we really want to be aggressive in bringing on new vendors, push digital marketing and bring on some headcount. Um, within the next few months, then we want to go on to the next version of our website, uh, adding on custom delivery services and then expanding outside the country, both to source our products and also to deliver. Uh, the team is composed of three very energetic young women uh, who live in Nairobi. And our ask for you guys today is uh, an introduction to any other e-commerce entrepreneurs focusing on specialty sectors, um, experience that you might have from e-commerce platforms on scale, uh, what works, what doesn't, referrals to mentors for our growing business, and of course, any advice on creating a defensible position. So we hope that you'll join us in solving Angela's problem and in bringing more beautiful things into the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helena, and the Wendo Africa. Judges to you. So I, I love the imagery and the and the consistency of your um, of, of your presentation. Um, and 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 weird, weirdly enough, um, I actually have some experience in e-commerce in Africa, um, and have dealt firsthand with Junia um, on a, on a variety of different instances. Um, two questions that i have for you and again not not to answer just kind of like reflections um the, the first is as you're mentioning that you have a growing business here um i didn't get really fully a sense of where you are today and then how you're scaling that up so, mm -hmm. so perhaps again going back to that whole attraction thing right highlighting that um and, and what you've done there um is is this because it felt to me like this was still at the concept phase and not at, actually at the growing business phase the second um, point here is, um, are you basically like Etsy is in the U.S.? And if, and if that's the case, you can basically save three minutes of, of description you know, to, <laughs> to an investor audience and just say, hey, we're Etsy for Africa, mm -hmm. right? And just kind of like stop there and then just get into the details <laughs> and we'll get what the hell does that actually mean? Yeah. Um, because I was trying to like, well, are, are, you, are you a platform? Are you trying to go after Jumia? And they're like, well, you're not like Jumia. I'm, like, I'm just trying to yeah. figure out exactly where you stand. And so I think I think you could really just just highlight what attributes of an Etsy or any other you know existing e-commerce platform in other parts of the world have that you're borrowing from, and then how you're going to then um, make that unique to the particular audience and market you're going after, right? Um, how does M-Pesa help you, right? Um, as 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 an advantage that that potentially you know may not exist elsewhere. So so that that would be the only part of the the strategic element of this that I would encourage you to think about is that um, plopping down you know one idea into a different market off, often doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But but having the insights as to what exactly is it that that's going to really allow that that concept that's already been established and proven and you know 15 plus billion dollar business you know in, in the north american market how can you basically replicate that with your insights of your local market and then mm -hmm. move your stories down so i i find this extremely compelling so thanks petra it's amazing. Uh, Pedro said uh, everything word for word that uh, I was going to say. <laughs> and uh, it, there is so much uh, wisdom in what he said. And I highly recommend take it to heart. And, uh, you know, many times uh, when uh, you have to give an elevator speech, uh, speech uh, if you just say we are, with, uh, we are Etsy for uh, Kenya, and uh, we Etsy doesn't do A, B, C, but we do that because that's needed for Kenya. Uh, yeah end of conversation, two minutes, uh, everybody <laughs> says, wow, 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 sounds great. To give you just an example, you say uh, Uber, everybody knows, uh, but what did Karim do that Uber could not do? Uh, mm -hmm. Karim took Uber concept and uh, made it for uh, Middle East and said many people don't have uh, uh, 
uh, credit cards, so we accept cash, and uh, mm -hmm. traffic is horrible in the uh, Middle East. Uh, so instead of uh, asking for a, uh, a car to come and uh, not being sure whether it takes 10 minutes or half an hour to show up, uh, you can uh, uh, schedule it in advance and have mm -hmm. a reserve it to arrive on right time. So it mm -hmm. was Uber pl uh, plus uh, cash payment and uh, reservation that Uber didn't have. And Uber paid uh, $3 billion to buy it. Thank you, Ken. All right. That was that it? If that's it, uh, if that was the last feedback. Thank you so much, Helena. Thank, Thank you. you so much, the Vendo team. Uh, great progress. Uh, well, guys, that was the all the teams for today. Uh, eight teams. I would like to just quickly show you just one quick slide. So, as as I said earlier. Uh, we have 28 CPIs in training going through the program right now. Some of them, actually half of them, went to be part of the teams that already pitched today. And the people that are now on the screen, they're pursuing their own business ideas. And I hope we will hear about their venture soon. I'm pretty, I'm super proud for uh, those people to join uh, our forces of, you know, bringing the, the program to new countries and to new endeavors. So right now, uh, I would like to ask you to do a, a public vote for the best pitch. Um, so, you know, we got eight teams pitching today. I'm going to start the polling. It's going to be a simple question, just like you can choose only one team. Um, it's up to you whom to nominate. And the polling starts right now. I'm going to give you a minute and a half, including the judges. You guys still, you, you can choose any of the teams. I will not share the results until the announcement later on. Uh, but uh, yeah, feel free to choose one of the teams that you think performed the best in terms of the pitching today. So we got uh, more than 50% already voted. All right, 64. So let me know if you can see the question and the poll question on the screen. I will give. But I can't little... see the poll. You cannot see the poll. Mm -mm. Aitash, how that? Okay. Mm, maybe what you can do is like leave the uh, the call and come back. Hopefully that will work. We'll wait okay. for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure, waiting for you. Okay, I got. Uh, so we still have 10 people that did not vote. Come on, guys. Yeah, let's make this a vote. Support your peers. What's going to happen next is that we're going to have a small break uh, for the uh, judges to deliberate a, a bit. So I will open a breakout room just for the judges. And uh, I'll leave you in the company of... Uh, uh, you know, the peers, you can all chat together, share some experiences. We'll be back as soon as the the, um, the voting is done by the judges. So it will not take too much time, I hope. Uh, so just like another, like, let's say, technical break for like five to ten minutes. And then for celebration purposes, you can start bringing up the beer, vodka, tea, whatever you want to <laughs> celebrate it with. Yeah, you guys did a great job, all of you. Very, very Thank good. Uh, great job. Uh, uh, amazing. Thank you, Cameron. Well done, well done. All right. Looks like almost all of you guys have uh, voted. I'm, I'm all ending the poll right now. Uh, making a screenshot for myself. Okay. I will not announce the, the, the don't public share poll. results. Don't share results. No, no, I don't I share results. Make... I, just, uh, I just hide this. Okay. So um, let's have a small break. Uh, for, as I said, like five to 10 minutes and we will be back. Judges, you should uh, have the invitation right now. Yeah, if, if we could just keep the break to, to, to less than five minutes, that would be great. Okay. Let's do it. Five minutes, guys, less than five. Okay. So Kamran, Michael, Pedro, I'm waiting for you in the room number one.
Meanwhile, Ozan, I'm already on my third glass of wine, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, yeah. I started early. It was to kill the nerves, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You must share. <laughs> Well, Dabo, you must share. You're from South Africa, you know, so you have to share like all the great white. Ah, you're drinking water. Ah, Dabo. I thought we could be friends, but I'm doubting now. <laughs> no, the water is, is just to clear the throat for the wine. <laughs> the wine Are you already coming. allowed to buy alcohol and stuff now in South Africa? Yeah. So everything has been lifted now. Yeah. So in South Africa, just for the rest to know, one, once Corona hit, they banned the purchase of all alcohol. Yeah. And how did people survive? <laughs> <laughs> they had to survive. They had to. Yeah. So, so Otherwise, there was the police, the police would arrest. But you know, there were people who were selling alcohol illegally. Mm. <laughs> Good business. So yeah. A business opportunity just opens. Yeah. So in the States, three things went up and I don't know what's the third thing um, with co because of COVID and staying home. Alcohol, sales of alcohol went up and the sale of pot went up. <laughs> I don't know what the third item was. So. <laughs> I think it was the number of babies, no? <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think the worst person to drink with is Igor. <laughs> Why? The, the now, worst or the drink. best? Does he drink? If he drinks, he showers in vodka. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. No. I'd love to drink with Ozan. I, I would love to hear what comes out uh, after after a few glasses of vodka. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sergey. Sergey, I would love to one day share a drink with you. Uh, why not? <laughs> <Might I love? laughs> but I'm not drinking vodka. That's the problem. I prefer wine. Ah, then South Africa is your place, man. Uh, yeah. I know that a lot of interesting and nice uh, wines from South Africa. Also, I have in Russia some of. Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, we uh, we have in our uh, winery retail in Russia some uh, examples of uh, New World and South African wines. Mm. Uh, That's and also friends of mine from uh, Swedish they travel to South Africa in order to find interest in uh, uh, wine chateau or wine, winery to export into Europe. Mm. Hey, Chris. Uh, nevertheless, I love to come. Uh, uh, maybe you come in wintertime, I come in summertime. <laughs> 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 I'm sure freeze to death in Russia. I must come in summer. Winter here, it's your summer, I'm sure. <laughs> well, yep. It's not so cold. It's just 10 degrees minus today. Sergei, you're just inviting Tabu. You know that there's like uh, 36 other people in this chat that uh, we'll just invite ourselves if you don't invite us. If Tabu comes, we all come together. No worries. That's yeah, well, let, Let's invite others to join us. And <laughs> <laughs> when is the next GIC meeting? Last time I was in Turkey. Where are we going next, Igor? You guys all missed the last time the GIC. We all went to boredom Turkey for a week. I've, oh. I've gotten to have those drinks with Ozan and uh, Igor. They must. When is the next one? There must be a post-pandemic announcement soon of where the next global summit is. Uh, I think we can go to Tanzania since Tanzania supposedly has no corona, at least according to the president. <laughs> I don't believe that, eh? Hey? <laughs> well, of not course not. <laughs> 
So the media is controlled. So there's other things that you can't really say much about. Yeah. So I don't believe that. Yeah, of course not. Yeah. yeah. In, in Turkey as well, uh, we we have been, uh, you know, uh, announced so low cases, so, num- so low numbers, and then suddenly in in a week or so we became the, you know, number two in the world in terms of number of cases suddenly. So. <laughs> Wow, Tanzania I mean, yeah, might be number one. It's just that according to the pre- they declared they did a declaration. They say we declare Corona dead. There's no Corona anymore in this country. So they just stopped reporting their numbers. <laughs> so probably I mean it's more frightening because a lot of people have Corona, um, but you just don't know. It's not very controlled. But hey, yeah. What what happened in Turkey was everywhere in every global charts. It was like you know, uh, Turkey was named as doesn't share actual numbers kind of a thing and then it started to hit you know currency rates and stuff Mm -hmm. and then they came to their senses somewhat i can say Mm -hmm. you guys know how bad it is over here it's we have uh i don't know it's not getting any better anytime soon so we shall see but how is it on um on the russia side Oh, yeah, I, I was looking at your name. I didn't know if you were going to answer and come on. I was like, I know I'm I can here. get here to jump in. <laughs> How you doing, bro? Good, good. Hey, by the oh, way, yeah. to, uh, to all participants, uh, really good pitches. I'm sending the live uh, stream to cohort number three, where we got uh, nine participants from Russia. I wanted them to double check that, you know, how you guys pitched today is very good. I'm impressed. And yeah, we're, we're fighting. I mean, the numbers are growing. Um, they're still not stable. Uh, me and my family, we, we we went through the whole cycle. So we're good now. And we can travel to any country <laughs> because we have, yeah. you know, the antibodies. Mm. Yeah. Sergey, you wanted to add something. Go ahead, my friend. Yeah. Um, what could I wait? It's, uh, I'm st- staying at home, trying uh, not to get out of... Uh, and contact as, as less people as possible. But uh, it's very logical, and for me, it's not a problem. So I can stay a long time uh, in a uh, small space, uh, do my background. Uh, my background, I, I served in South Berlin for several years. So for me, staying uh, locked is not uh, so difficult. Like for many people who prefer big areas, mountains, open areas, etc. Well, uh, honestly saying, uh, Russia is, uh, uh, according to official uh, information, we more or less uh, fighting and we start this vaccination vaccine. You, maybe you've heard about it. Uh, two days ago, started this uh, uh, vaccination okay. pro- program. Okay. Sergey, sorry, yeah. is that the vaccine that turns anybody into a Russian? Is that the one? Yes, yes, that's one. <laughs> you, are, you feel comfortable at minus 30 immediately and uh, attempt to move to Siberia immediately. <laughs> that, was, that was our secret weapon, you know. We, we fooled everybody. Now we created a vaccine that turns off. You know, half of the world into Russian-speaking people. <laughs> no. But uh, yes, yeah, so we are. Uh, in terms of figures, we are number five in uh, numbers of uh, infected people in the uh, globe. Uh, also, due to a big population, like many countries, with my. Um, Millions of people, they have high score. But uh, I believe we'll uh, pass through these uh, challenges next year. And uh, uh, well, listen, and, uh, I've been listening for startup Russian, I would say, ideas, startup ideas uh, 10 days ago. And uh, when I hear from the startup idea that we uh, challenge this COVID situation, I'm asking, 
I assure that when you come to market with your product in two years from now, COVID will, will be still the challenge for mankind. I hope we are, in two years we manage to understand how to uh, deal with COVID and uh, where there will be less drama in this case, in the globe. That's okay. Why am I talking about Russia? Russia, that's not special. <laughs> How's Kenya living? Hello, Kenya. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Kenya doing well. Although the cases are still rising, but uh, right now I think a lot of people have come to get accustomed to the new ways of life. Yeah, still challenging a lot of information from all sources, but I think right now it's more manageable than when it started off. But the safaris are still on, the game parks are still open. It's the best place to be during this period. No interaction, all the space that you want is there. So welcome, it's the best time to be here. I feel like everyone is pitching for the, the reunion, please. We have Russia, we have Kenya, we have South Africa. <laughs> Who else? <laughs> Let's we, we, need, we, need that, we need that trip. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a must. We need it. Well, w once, once Igor and Kamran are back um, to this chat, maybe we, we should ask them after the announcement uh, whether it's a good idea or not to have maybe a global GIC reunion somewhere in summer 2021. I think it would be good. We would have, you know, 200 people total from around the world so far. We should select the closest uh, point to every one of us. Uh, well, I, I Turkey, expect Turkey. it will be somewhere in Sahara. No. Well, Turkey, <laughs> Turkey. Turkey was good. Yeah, because uh, it has, you know, a lot of uh, visa free to, to many, many countries and actually we flew yes, from, from all the countries, uh, including Africa, Middle East, Russia, United States, Europe. A uh, bunch of countries were present. Maybe, well, we'll see. You know, it's it's up to the GIC to decide. Let's go to that happy place, uh, and Bhutan. Right? So GIC to... moved headquarters from uh, uh, Silicon Valley to Turkey. So techie it is, I vote yes. <laughs> I and, vote it's, for it's pretty, and it's pretty affordable too, you know, you got the resorts, you got the sea, nice weather, good, uh, good food, mm -hmm. so everything is right there. And the weather is perfect, yes. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's calculating how long Will it take to fly from location <laughs> the allocation to Turkey? <laughs> <laughs> I've been gone for a couple of minutes, so are you settled in coming to Turkey? I've missed it. <laughs> no, we were discussing you, how you are arranging for all of us um, for accommodation and everything. So we're waiting for the confirmation email. We all okay, have now, voted you. So, so I'll come up with a follow-up idea for a startup, you know, on, <laughs> travel, <laughs> on international. Maybe, maybe we'll book a jet and then fly through all, all of our occasions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Guys, I think you're mistaken. <laughs> We're not giving any money at the end of this. So where's <laughs> the come from? It's like we leave for five minutes, everybody's flying with jets. What the heck? <laughs> We've given oh, the price can... money, Ozan, so you 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 can't change. <laughs> Just let me know. And Lina, don't, don't worry. We are not picky. We can sleep in your garden. We can camp in your garden, sleep on your couch, you know. <laughs> okay. It's just uh, Sergey, because he's Russian. He will come with the jet. But uh, <laughs> 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 the rest of us, we're not picky. Don't worry. <laughs> as so long as bring you bring them up, then sleeping bags. <laughs> sleeping bags are okay. Man, this was difficult. We said it in the last five minutes, it took forever. Ah, oh, God. This is always the most difficult piece. I mean, it's like Pedram said this very well. It's like picking up who's your like, most beloved child when you have like 40 of them. Like, you remember all, you've been through them all. Like, So, yeah, it's tough. But this is not like, a, oh, you're the best startup ever. It's not that time. We just want to appreciate your time and efforts and 
the progress actually that you made. Um, thank you so much for the CPI. Thank you so much for all the participants. Uh, Igor is coming back shortly. Before that, Kamran, um, do you want to kind of uh, take the floor and mention why the heck did you build GIC for and are you happy with the results? You're on mute. Uh, having such a difficult time uh, selecting uh, uh, selecting uh, a uh, startup. Uh, usually he's uh, very uh, determined and he says that uh, he wants this, he doesn't like that or whatever, but today he was uh, saying that he liked all eight uh, teams and uh, uh, he says uh, he likes all of them uh, so much that uh, uh, he is uh, willing to uh, spend another hour, hour and a half uh, with any of you uh, that are interested uh, next week. Uh, I guess uh, Igor uh, or uh, Ozan, you know the time, uh, announced it to everyone. Uh, he liked uh, all of these uh, so much that uh, he said that uh, he's happy to spend an uh, hour, hour and a half uh, with any of you who are interested to spend time with him. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, I had never seen that before in the previous cohort. So you guys did a great job <laughs> making it so difficult for him to select. Yeah. Well, um, thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, waiting a bit here. Uh, thanks a lot for um, uh, pitching today. It's, uh, as I said, this is our second purely online uh, cohort. We're super grateful for having this amazing 40 people from so many different countries and different cultures. And uh, it turned out today that a couple of the teams actually helped each other. Like I didn't know that, for instance, Saeed helped the, the vendor team and like all this uh, collaboration in between the teams that has happened. This is absolutely amazing. This is why we're actually uh, doing this kind of a program. So you can actually um, uh, develop yourselves together with the other peers. So this is all amazing. Thank you so much for being part of this journey. Uh, you are all winners. Uh, you are all uh, entrepreneurs. And today's nominations is just uh, to kind of like give you a small boost. And as uh, Cameron mentioned, Pedro would like uh, to provide an, uh, an hour up to 90 minutes to you guys next Tuesday. I'm going to send all these details on Slack later on. But uh, basically, this means that it was a tough decision. Uh, we were not able to come to a conclusion super fast, even though Pedram had to leave. So he proposed, he, he gladly proposed to uh, work with all of you because you just all deserve it. So uh, we're going to start with this um, announcements uh, with the public vote. This is something that you guys, you chose this. So none of the team members uh, actually uh, was involved in this one. So the, the best pitch award, which is a, a public vote, goes to Pure Mart. So congrats to Pure Mart. You did a great job in presenting. <laughs> Uh, I think we all agree they actually, <laughs> they actually uh, were a bit far than the others. So they, it's, it's not like, you know, it was like very close, but this is like a clear winner. So good job on the presenting. Thank uh, you, guys. Thank you very much. Good job, Fadi. Really appreciate it. Good, good one. Good job, so, Fadi. Good job. So next nomination will be the best startup progress. I would like... Um, uh, to ask Ozan to say a couple of words and then I will continue on this one. Yeah, I mean, um, progress is usually uh, hard to manage in a startup, especially in a 10, 12 week period. But coming back and forth with questions and answers and hard work and learning and relearning and iterating and pivoting is just one way of progress. Like it may not end up anywhere uh, but the learning path is very important and sometimes very visible within a team. And I did not make the nomination. Igor made the nomination. I just said yes. So I would very much like to see this team go forward, do a little bit more uh, because I always want them to do more. Uh, but a big congratulations to... <laughs> Wendell! <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, I think, you know, we all agree that this team has <laughs> deserved basically what happened. They did a couple of uh, pivots during the program. They, I mean, you can even say that from the names, they changed it from the uh, Zawadi yeah. to Wendo Gifts to now Wendo Africa. They actually onboarded a couple of um, the vendors on the platform. They actually went to the market and, and talked to the real customers. And actually, I think that um, this team made a lot of progress. I'm not saying you guys, the other teams made less progress. I'm just saying that these guys were uh, actually not afraid to pivot and take this really uh, to the next level. Congratulations to the vendor. And let's move on to the next one. Come run. Um, Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the most promising startup, this is how we call this nomination. Come run. Yes, uh, so we were again uh, having a lot of discussions trying to figure out uh, uh, which one uh, we can say as uh, uh, most uh, uh, as the best startup or most promising or whatever, and it was very difficult. Uh, and uh, but uh, when we looked at uh, what uh, they have done and what the uh, promise is, uh, we all said that uh, uh, Yatir has a lot of uh, promise there because uh, so many. Uh, young families uh, are uh, looking into ways uh, to connect their children to the roots. And uh, it, this is great that they're starting uh, with Arabic, but uh, if uh, they take this to many other languages, many other things, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, cultural uh, stories that could be passed. Uh, and many, many people would, uh, really like that and would like uh, to uh, see that connection to the roots uh, be there, whether it is a tribe in Africa or a, a group of nomads in Central Asia or uh, in uh, uh, Latin America. You know, there is uh, always uh, uh, that connection and transformation of stories going from one generation to another. So uh, we all uh, thought that that was a promising idea. Yeah. So good job, Yatir. Thank you. From my side, I would just add that, you know, with the help of technology, we can automate a lot of stuff like all this like day to day routines, but not sure that technology can that fastly substitute people and people interaction and all these cultural things that you can hardly uh, teach uh, with the machine learning or something, the machine on how do you actually, you know, like all this kind of like jokes and all this like cultural learnings from your grandma to your to, to your kids and grand grandkids so i think there's a big potential over there and they're tackling a very interesting and, and uh, good market yeah i see that as a companion uh, to the grandma or to the parents you know if a grandma and a granddad uh, are too old and can't do that uh, parents could uh, just uh, take that um, uh, as a companion and uh, start to tell stories and learn it listen to it first and then sell it uh, to their kids uh, so lots mm -hmm. of good could be there and thanks everyone thanks everyone we hope we would go really as uh, promising like you don't have any other option you got the award you can just bail out come no. on we'll kick our ass if you drop the ball okay. <laughs> you have a really you change your you middle name for my name so i'll take see? it for, see? okay yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Shep, I, see that's that's I, I was wondering who would notice that so it's good job yeah, that, that. <laughs> well done. thank you so everyone. for the uh, Chairman's choice, uh, I really uh, uh, was struggling between two very promising uh, ones. I always look at uh, who has uh, the best and the highest chance for uh, positive social impact in a uh, new way. And uh, uh, obviously, I really liked uh, what uh, East Africa Factory was uh, doing. Uh, it, uh, I would say that would be the runner up, but my final choice is the uh, one that uh, uh, I really think uh, is a good way is uh, the uh, techno prize. Uh, the way that uh, the organization has a chance to create a lot of jobs uh, for disabled people. Uh, but if you uh, really capture their experiences and uh, leverage upon it and uh, help uh, the work of 10 people or 100 people affect the lives of a million people uh, because uh, they uh, can understand that this could be quite, quite uh, 
an impact. Uh, so I would be more than happy to help uh, uh, you guys uh, to achieve this and uh, uh, very much I want to hear more from uh, what you guys are doing with this and how you are taking it uh, uh, away uh, and, uh, you know, growing it uh, uh, massively. So I really look forward to that. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you. <laughs> oh, one thing, by the way, the best, one of the top companies in the world that does the same job here in the US was started by a Stanford alone. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 <That's good. laughs> well, congratulations to all of you guys. As I said, you're all winners. These nominations is just a small, uh, you know, just a small uh, push for you. As, as, uh, as Ozan mentioned, if you drop out, Kamran is going to follow you <laughs> and all of that. <laughs> and the Absolutely. Friends. All of you, we want to, uh, uh, you have a lot of potential, a lot of good ideas, and uh, we want to see the things uh, really happen. I mean, when Tariq was talking about what uh, uh, the agri lot uh, could do and a potential to help uh, really revive uh, farming in Africa, uh, as I said, uh, sorry, in Saudi Arabia, uh, the East Africa factory. I am so excited and would be very happy to help you guys. Uh, uh, Compute was quite interesting uh, approach uh, to see uh, what uh, the great uh, company out of Russia is doing uh, with some uh, traction. Uh, the field sports is a very good one, uh, really compelling. Uh, uh, Pure Mart, everybody voted on it. Uh, Techno Price, uh, we already talked about it. Yatir, we talked and Wendo. All of these were quite uh, interesting thing. And uh, again, I repeat, uh, I've never seen the Petrom having difficulty selecting one company. He kept saying, I, I don't know which one to select. All of them are good. So yeah, my, our guys, hats off to you. Proud you of you. To be careful. And look forward uh, to having more conversations on how we can really increase uh, the impact. And uh, to all of the CPIs, uh, I guess uh, we are having a session, a special session uh, later on. Uh, this week and uh, we really want to look into this and say how can we really scale up and go and do something amazing uh, for Africa, something amazing for Middle East, something amazing uh, for Asia, for Latin America. How can we really go and do uh, something in a big way uh, to help create the jobs of future uh, for the young people and uh, enable the innovation economy uh, to really transfer uh, the power from the hands of old men to the hands of the youth and uh, really give them a chance to go and drive uh, uh, the future. So I look forward to that. Thank you all. And, uh, Thank you yeah. all. Love you very much. Great job. Good job to everyone, guys. If, if we can do a photo, uh, like if you all can start the videos, it would be super cool. So I can have all of you in the gallery and make a big big picture to summarize our okay i got the first portion <laughs> here let's make some noise let's make some moves guys congrats yeah, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one hold on i still have another one let's do one more yay <laughs> <laughs> that's so good uh, that feels so good. Thanks so much for Thank you. for all the effort, for all everything you did during the program. You made me proud. We were just corresponding with Azan during the, pro, the the session while you were pitching. Like you know, this is just speechless. You are you made us proud. Thank you so much yep. for that. Yeah. But also, for Ozan. Thanks so much to you as well, huh? Yeah, well, thanks, guys. Thank yeah, really, we should thank uh, both Igor and Ozan. Yes, you guys uh, are great. So uh, we love you thank much. You. And uh, you guys do things that uh, I could never do. I wish uh, when I was starting my company, I had people like Ozan and uh, Igor helping us. <laughs> well, that's it. You know, <laughs> when I was a kid, I had no chance, no mentorship, nothing. <laughs> No, we got a big team, guys. It's just me and uh, Ozan that are like business business editors. But we got, you know, Samir and Merlin, Claire. And oh, yeah, absolutely. All of the whole GIC team. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you all. Oh, Love good. you. Thanks. Thank Be you, safe. guys. Thanks, everybody. Keep you in touch.
a final Thank note you, on, on, on flag. Thanks to the mentors. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Great, Great pleasure. Yalla. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well done, guys. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye bye. Good job, Tracy. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. The cost was you good. Did good. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, um, thanks, Mohammed. <laughs> Bye, guys. Asher, thanks.